so much, uh, my dear friend uh, Koshi and whole team, uh, Rajni, Vidya, Karthik. Uh, you very, um, I was impressed by how you know well you had organized things. So I'm glad to hear this is a student uh, initiative. Um, so I thank all of you for being here, uh, students and faculty and everyone. Um, and just as a note too, you know, especially now in the age of the Zoom and being able to do different things, you know, Oshi and I met because I used to live in India and teach in India. And, you know, I, I, and I've been in America now for some years and yeah, I, I, I miss uh, the energy and the different feeling. Um, when you have students from India, and in particularly when you're discussing Indian things, things about India's past, things about India's culture, languages, literature, you know, there's a completely different relationship that a, a, a born and bred Indian has towards that um, than uh, you know, a, you know, a American or. European student who's interested in learning something about world literature. Not that that's not a good thing, but there's a difference uh, to, to that. Um, you know, so, you know, for example, I don't need to necessarily sit down and explain what the Ramayana is to everyone first and then talk about different. I mean, you have some basic understanding, you know, whether, you know, you know, every detail or you just know the basic story, you know what's going on. I can it, there's a, there are these cultural references uh, that, that are important. So anyway, just as a aside, I just want to say it's a pleasure to speak to particularly young Indian researchers and scholars in the humanities. Uh, and again, particularly in the study of uh, Indian knowledge um, in Indian languages. So on that note, uh, I put a little presentation together about uh, Kalidasa uh, and in particular translating Kalidasa into English. And um, I just have a couple of verses to analyze with uh, some comparative translation stuff. I'll throw out some ideas in a, you know, very you know, ill-formed way probably, uh, but just some raise some points. And then hopefully I'd be very happy to have a robust discussion. And I want to hear from all of you what kind of research you're doing, the kind of questions you're asking, and the things that we can consider. So I'm going to tr try to share this presentation. Okay. All right, Koji, can you see that? Is that a yes? Yes, yes, sir. It's okay. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Looks good. All right. So, I mean, even from the title, not not because academics love alliteration. So, um, the the word translation itself literally means if you translated it from you know its latin roots uh it's to carry across so to to move something from one place to another from one context to another fundamentally that's what translation is um at a very general level here we're going to talk mostly about of course translating literature um, between two different languages um, but also, and this is a, a point that I really want to underscore because it really does reflect to, uh, in, in certain comparative ways to other traditions of non-English literature being translated in English, and that is to look at the literariness of a translation. So we're talking about kailas, we're talking about poetry of the highest order, you know, and we want to talk about translation, of course, not just the meaning, but also some of that poetic power uh into the you know target language whatever it may be or in this case it'll be english um so to to just to reflect on a few things um we just discussed what translation is to carry over uh there are other terms that get used um in the translation studies world um one of them being refractions we'll look at that one what that means we have a word transcreations, which actually I think 
maybe it didn't originate in regard to South Asia, but it definitely has been used many times, uh, particularly in regard to things like, you know, the Telugu Mahabharata or whatever is not a translation the way we think of it. It's a transcreation of this kind of text of this story. Then you come to the fact that there's no real like proper word in an Indian language for translation, the way that the Western, you know, kind of framework epistemology, at least of, you know, modern Western thought thinks of it. Um, there's no real sense of let's move this thing to that thing. Um, the best, and this is like more in modern usage, you know, people use the word anuad. Anuad, uh, you know, that's good, but it's, that doesn't exactly mean uh, translation in the way we, we think of it, um, again, in that Western mode, which fundamentally we're, we're, you know, that's the base from which we're using this because that's the starting place that we have. Uh, so anyway, anuva is, you know, to imitate, to speak, to repeat, to re resound, to echo. And I think words like echo, resounding, these words have more in common with what I would say would be an Indian kind of definition of like translation. It's a refraction. And that's when we come to this, this word. And this is a, one of famous translation scholar. And I'll just read the definition. Um, refractions carry a work of literature over from one system into another. They are determined by such factors as patronage, poetics, and ideology. So this is all really important, um, you know, extra like kind of literary stuff. This interpretive framework gives a new legitimacy to the study of literary translations by illuminating their creation of canons and traditions in the target culture. Now, let me break down that last sentence, particularly the end of it, because that's the uh, a theme that I, I'll try to return to later, is that, you know, oftentimes we think that there's kind of an original, and, you know, th th it was written in this language, that's the original, and then this is a translation. So the translations, you know, they can never really do it any justice, and it's it's really just a, a, a way to access that, that other uh, language that you don't know. But what he's getting at here is, again, the literariness of a, of a translation. And therefore, that kind of work actually, you know, revitalizes the target language in a way, you know, and, and like he says, creates maybe a whole set of new works, a whole canon, or even, you know, a long standing tradition. So, and I, we'll come back to this theme, particularly into a, a quote by Ezra Pound about translation. And, 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 and just really how, it, 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 it just to ground it in an Indian context, like the example I gave before, you know, when Telugu becomes like a literary language, when Kannada becomes like a literary language, what do they first do? They translate the Mahabharata, um, but not the way that we, it's not like verse for verse is being translated exactly. No, they took the basic story. They took out things they didn't like. They, you know, maybe added a few things they, you know, from regional stories like that, you know, they translated, which again, as I mentioned before, um, the word that's become popular there is they've transcreated that text. So just to sum up what I'm trying to say here is there's a there's a real spectrum and range of, you know, kind of ways in which we can think about this idea of translation um, from both Eastern and Western perspectives um, that are pretty, you know, complex. Um, they involve a lot more than just, let's say, the text. All right. So one of the most important things um, is the relationship of translation to ideas about power and prestige. Of course, those go together um, and what that means. And, you know, why is it that Telugu and Kannada want to translate the Mahabharata? Because the Mahabharata is written in Sanskrit and the Sanskrit is the language of the gods, Devavani. Um, now, what's interesting about Sanskritan is that, you know, it's very refined, it's very clear. Um, in a way, I would say it's kind of closed, you know, like it's just complete in and of itself. So it doesn't really need it. And the other thing, contrary to what I think a lot of people want to promote, that which is fine, having you know, spoken Sanskrit is, is fine. But generally, we understand that 
you know, Sanskrit was not a, 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 a um, you know, a, a spoken uh, language. It was, you know, based on a, probably a, a high class, you know, Prakrit, but it's that formalization by things like, you know, Panini that make Sanskrit, you know, a literary language of refinement. It's a language of literary, you know, work. So it's not really a spoken language. Um, barring what you might see in some of the plays in terms of, you know, high caste characters that, that do speak in Sanskrit and stuff. But um, again, that's in a literary context. It's, a play is not, you know, exactly what was happening in real life. Um, so just a couple of quotes from Sheldon Pollock, who is the uh, guy who, sorry, I shouldn't say, is a scholar who wrote uh, a very important book called The Language of the Gods and the World of Men. Um, you should all check it out. Um, raises some really important, interesting ideas, particularly the idea of vernacularization, which is kind of what I'm talking about right now. So there's a, also a connection between vernacularization, as in like when lit languages become literary, and the act of translation itself. So it's an interesting book. It's it's important if you want to read more about this kind of thing. Um, so he says the work Sanskrit did did do was beyond the quotidian and the instrumental. Right. See, there's something more than just kind of like the, the everyday about it. It was directed above all towards articulating a form of political consciousness, a celebration of aesthetic power. Um, this is, these are powerful words, um, but fundamentally like, you know, Sanskrit has like this kind of, you know, you just mention it and it has a kind of awe and reverence and respect that's due to it. That's what we're talking about in terms of like language prestige. Now, English, another very, very powerful language, even particularly right now, um, not only in the colonial period, but let's say even right now and even globally, not just in India, um, is very different in the sense that English is constantly changing. It's all constantly adding new words. It's, it's very dynamic. It's fluid. It's absorbent. It's very spoken you know, in different, different kind of dialects and different ways, and it's written. So English is a very calm, I mean, there's been a, a lot of critique of English. Of course, we don't want monolingualism, but, you know, English also is a very powerful, amazing language, um, and we should not forget this. Um, now, in regard to what English does in terms of its, like, you know, um, colonial connection to India. Well, it's, it's exactly what we're going to get into in a section, but, but you know, um, serve to convert, this is Bernard Cohen, serve to convert indigenous forms of textualized knowledge into instruments of colonial rule. Indigenous forms of textualized knowledge, instruments of colonial rule. Means what? It was important for the English to learn Indian languages so they might better control India. It's like, you know, like warriors, like know thy enemy kind of thing. And that's how many, many, you know, people went into translating texts and learning about the stuff. And then there's, you have the development of, you know, all these Asiatic societies. And this is the lot of people. And this is another theme I want to underscore too. These are the guys that are branded, you know, um, the Orientalists. And we're going to look at some typical Orientalists and, and what that word kind of also means from both, uh, you know, uh, it, it's like a, a fine edged blade, you know, with, with two sides. That's what Orientalism is. It's very tricky like that. Um, so we'll get more into that in a second. Um, and just one last quote from Harish Trivedi. Um, and this is interesting, although it's incorrect. I, I, I've actually found a, a number of ex counter examples to this. Um, but the point is still valid, and that's why I appreciate it. Um, and this gets back to like some ideas about power and, and, and language. Uh, so he says, on the whole, throughout this long period of recorded literary history in India, from about 1500 BC to 1800 CE, like 3,000 years, there is, astonishingly, he says, no surviving evidence of any text of any kind having been translated into an Indian language. That, like I said, is not correct, but it's there are very there are examples, but they're few. 
Um, and in particular, when we say Indian language, we're saying Sanskrit here for a large part of that history. And it's true, things generally were not translated into this language. That's what I mean by the kind of closeness of it. It was like, it didn't need to absorb any new stuff. It was already like fine, but you know, translating out of it, like if you want to share that knowledge and you want to understand what, what we're writing in Sanskrit, then go ahead. <laughs> so that's a, a very interesting thing um, that, that I think, uh, well, it certainly changed later on and during colonial times. Um, and then certainly into modernity, of course, there's lots of intra, you know, language translation in India. So now we're going to come to, you know, the main topic of translating Kalidasa in English. And you can't discuss that subject without discussing this seminal, you know, 18th century, late 18th century translation by Sir William Jones, who you've all probably heard of. Um, and I'll just read this this quote because this quote in his his preface, you know, I think says a lot um, about the things that we want to discuss. So this is what William Jones says about his uh, English 1789 English translation of Shakuntala by Kalidasa. I soon procured a correct copy of it, and assisted by my teacher Ramalochana, began with translating it verbally into Latin which bears so great a resemblance to Sanskrit that it is more convenient than any modern language for a scrupulous interlinear version. I then turned it word for word into English and afterwards, without adding or suppressing any material sentence, disengaged from the stiffness of a foreign idiom and prepared the faithful translation of the Indian drama which I now present to the public as a most pleasing and authentic picture of old Hindu manners and one of the greatest curiosities that the literature of Asia has yet brought to light. This is a fascinating quote to me. Um, so let's break it down step by step, which is very interesting. Number one, he wanted to make an English translation, but in order to do that, he went through another language. This is also a common uh, thing that happens in translations. Like sometimes you'll make a translation of a translation. So, you know, there's like an inter-language in, in there. So the inter-language here is Latin. And of course, William Jones is famous for, you know, finding and, and, and bringing to light the connection between Sanskrit and Latin and Greek. And this is what explodes into the whole Indo-European, you know, language family idea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I find it fascinating that first he goes to Latin, then he goes for a word for word in English. So there's all these steps that he's he's telling us about. And then he says, without adding or suppressing anything, so he really wants to get everything in there, he disengages from the stiffness of a foreign idiom. So this is what, at least as I read Jones, to be you know a comment on his literariness, the fact that he didn't want a literal word for word translation, that he was actually trying to create something that was not stiff and prepared a faithful, again, this is the important word when it comes to translation, you know, faithful uh, translation of the Indian drama, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the last part is really where the Orientalist hit comes in, you know? The most pleasing, authentic picture of old Hindu manners. Okay, I mean, you could say that that's fine. Um, but one of the greatest curiosities, that word is so, you know, in the Orientalist kind of spirit, like that that sense of like, oh, it's so exotic and curious, that feeling. Um, but again, this idea of Orientalism, you know, and, and, and the kind of fetishizing of the East and the, the spirituality of it all, I mean, we have to take that every kind of critique that we have of that Oriental thing is based in a certain kind of positive reality. That, yes, this is an amazing piece of literature. Yes, this is about the manners of, you know, Hindus in the olden days. Yes, you know, this is about an uh, incredibly beautiful woman with an amazing love story that happens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things can be true together. So what I really am trying to suggest through all of this is that Tropes like Orientalism, you know, cut both ways. And we'll try to look at some examples of that as we move forward. So 
Well, one one aspect right here um, that is also famous that everyone always talks about um, is Goethe in Germany uh, reading a translation of, or maybe I think he read a translation of Jones's English Shakuntala, and just falling in love with it and saying it was like this massive turning point in his entire perspective on literature. Um, and of course, this gets into all of, you know, the undercurrents of German romanticism. And again, this idea that the, the East is in, a, in kind of a good way, this like ancient place of wisdom and spirituality and, and truth and like, you know, a, 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 a kind of primordial, you know, goodness of, of, of the way things were. And so he writes this, you know, poem um, in German. And I'll read out the, the, the translation by Eastwick, which is the one that I found most commonly everywhere. And then just as, as an example of something interesting, um, you know, now we have Google Translate. What does Google Translate do with this? And does it sound stiff and, you know, computer-like? And it's funny, the Google version, as you'll see in a second, sounds pretty good. It actually sounds like poetry. But anyway, here's what Goethe said about Shakuntala after being blown away by um, this, this play by Kalidasa. Wouldst thou the younger years blossom and the fruits of its decline, and all by which the soul is charmed, enraptured, feasted, fed? Wouldst thou the earth and heaven itself in one sole name combine? I name thee, O Shakuntala, and all at once is said. So that was a little hard to follow. So let, let me read this modern version. And then I want to go show a verse from Kalidasa himself that um, kind of sounds to me like the inspiration for this, uh, uh, you know, conceit that he's, he's having here. So do you want the blossoms of the early years, the fruits of later years? Do you want what charms and delights? Do you want what satiates and nourishes? Do you want to understand the sky, the earth, with one name? I call you Shakuntala. And so everything is said. It's actually a pretty good poem that way. Um, it's really, and, and, you know, it, what, what I'm trying to suggest in quoting this also is just, you know, the, he, he falls in love with Shakuntala, basically. And for him, like, she represents beauty, writ large, like everything that is beauty is contained within this perfect Shakuntala. So let's look at, yeah, this is a, this is a verse from Megadutha. Um, and this is what Kalidasa says. And this whole idea that, you know, beauty has to be like a totality of an experience, you know? So he says, I can see your sunlit arms in the vines of the Prianguine, your eyes in the glance of a startled doe, your glowing face in the moon, your hair in the plume of a peacock, and your playful brows in the gentle waves of a flowing river. But alas, my perfect one, there is no single pl place where I can see all of you. Oh, beautiful. So again, the, the, you know, the, the, the wholeness of beauty is, a, is something to look at. All right, now we'll look, let's look at, we're gonna, I have two verses um, that we can, we can look at um, with multiple translations. And although, you know, it's not always fair to like compare translations, it's always fun. And uh, it is revealing of certain things that I hope to elucidate a little bit. So here we go. These are all from Shakuntala, these last two. Um, so this one is very famous verse. And again, it, 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 it's, the, it's the sense of what beauty is, uh, what, all the ways that I can describe beauty, because to describe beauty is to describe perfection. So here I just gave you a little, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to read the Sanskrit. I mean, if you can and enjoy it, then please do. There's interesting things that we could talk about. Um, you know, how do you deal with certain things? Like, for example, even in the second line, Lakshma Lakshmim, 
you know, he's using, of course, a very nice, you know, uh, alliterative kind of, you know, repetition there. You know, do you try to carry that over into the translation or not? Let's see if anyone does. Um, so the idea here is, you know, the lotus, you know, because it grows out of the mud and even if it has a little moss on it, it's still like really beautiful. Um, the the moon, which has, you know, those marks in it, even though it has them, that's actually what makes it so wonderful. Um, and then this Shakuntala, who wears these, you know, very coarse bark garments, um, those things don't, uh, you know, detract from her beauty. In fact, they, they kind of highlight it because, you know, um, well, then the last line is, 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 you know, something about the totality of forms. Um, so let's see how it gets translated by these different authors over time. Um, and, and just to, again, to mention, you know, the fact that like, this was the text that Jones picked is also important to think about because it's not to say that Kalidasa wasn't considered like one of the greatest, if not the greatest Sanskrit poet, even within the Sanskrit tradition. There was plenty of verses in Sanskrit, in the tradition that, you know, think of him so highly. So he was definitely like someone to, 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 to read. And, you know, Shakuntala is probably the most famous play ever written. Um, so it was, it was kind of like the greatest hit already. Um, so it was, uh, uh, and, and like I said, then it also became so important because it was about this love story and all of these other things. So here we go with these images of love. Sir William Jones, I'll read them out and kind of, we can have some discussion after. The water lily, though dark moss may settle on its head, is nevertheless beautiful. And the moon with dewy beams is rendered yet brighter by its black spots. The bark itself acquires elegance from the features of a girl with the antelope's eyes and rather augments than diminishes my ardor. Interesting. Okay. It's actually not bad. Not a bad translation. Pretty accurate. Um, he's not doing anything with rhyming, which is interesting because in those days, like people learned to rhyme and, and even later days they were, but in modern English, it's not really considered very cool to rhyme. Um, so let's see what happens next. Okay, so this is Sir Monier Williams, also a very famous kind of, you know, one of, you know, in that tradition of great Europeans who were like great Sanskrit masters. I mean, Monier Williams wrote the dictionary. If you see that Monier Williams dictionary, it's huge. It's the, the go-to Sanskrit English dictionary that you could ever have. And it's, you know, a, a monumental achievement. So here's his translation. The lotus with the Shaivala entwined is not a whit less brilliant. Dusky spots heighten the luster of the cold rain moon. This lovely maiden in her dress of bark seems all the lovelier. Even the meanest garb gives to true beauty fresh attractiveness. Huh. That last line is a little unpleasant. Even the meanest garb, but gives true beauty fresh attractiveness. Um, is kind of, uh, that's nice. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. Oh, okay. This is, these are interesting. Um, the, this is from Arthur Ryder, um, who was actually a professor at Berkeley where I went to grad school and he was kind of this, I mean, he wasn't there when I was there, but before my time, but he was very famous for being a very kind of, uh, charismatic um, professor and translator of Sanskrit literature. He had many famous students, particularly Robert Oppenheimer, who took a Bhagavad Gita class from him, which is how Oppenheimer was able to quote that line when the atom bomb went off. So that was, Ryder was his guru um, in that. Uh, and I just thought these quotes that were on the inside of his Kalidasa book were really interesting. Poets are the trumpets which sing to battle. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And that's why Shelley. Um, that, that particularly the last line, poets are the unacknowledged legislator of the world. That is something that will come up in Indian literature um, about poetry, about what word is, what, what you know, the generative power of, of you know, words. Um, 
actually it goes all the way back um really if you think about it um so anyway here's uh, arthur Ryder, um and here you'll see like you know he's kind of old school and he uses the rhyme scheme which well let's hear how it sounds the meanest vesture glows on beauty that enchants the lotus lotus lovelier shows amid, amid dull water plants the moon in added splendor shines for its spot of dark Yet more the maiden slender charms in her dress of bark. Uh, okay. Um, you know, everybody's hitting all the right. I mean, no one's missing the meaning, I think, at all. A little bit, uh, you could, uh, William Jones seemed to be reading something a little different in the last couple lines or in the last line. But you know, for the most part, people are doing pretty well. Now, Okay, here's Chandarajan, her famous collection from Penguin. Um, Though inlaid in duckweed, the lotus glows. A dusky spot enhances the moon's radiance. That lissom girl is lovelier far dressed in bark. What indeed is not an adornment to entrancing forms? See, this one, you know, again, from a literary I had to just critique it a little bit, sorry. Um, you know, lissom, you know, those are words that are like Victorian in nature. You know, this is, uh, you know, and, and this is an Indian, I think, woman, uh, or maybe not, uh, whoever Chandarajan is, uh, you know, of, of, of the kind of like, you know, let's put it into the king's English. Uh, so, you know, I feel like sometimes it's a, or, you know, a little, I don't know. It doesn't speak to like, you know, either a, a spoken English or even a modern like English sense of poetry. Um, so anyway, that's but this is all like part of the history of things moving along. So here we have Soma Deva Vasudeva, um, who I actually studied with for some time at, at Berkeley. And, you know, this is a hardcore Sanskrit scholar. So wants to have the meaning absolutely perfect you know, with all the constructions the way they should be. Um, so a lotus entangled with Shaivala weed is still attractive. The spot on the moon, though a blemish, is beauty. This slender maiden is most captivating, even wearing a bark cloth. For what could not serve as an adornment to sweet figures? I mean, there's a lot of similarities between those last two. But again, everyone's hitting the right thing. Okay, here's Barbara Stoller Miller, who came a little later. Um, actually, some of it was it was later, but um, Barbara Solomon Miller's after. And here's her translation: A tangle of duckweed adorns a lotus. A dark spot heightens the moon's glow. The bark dress increases her charm. Beauty finds its ornaments anywhere. Now, clearly, she's taken an approach where she wants to go with an economy of words, and it's not even clear to me like how the whole verse you know a tangle adorns a lotus but then she's saying at the end beauty finds its adorn ornaments anywhere so i don't know if it really hits the the meaning that he was uh getting at there but you know it's another version and again we can't say that it totally misses the mark or mistranslates something in the sense of not getting the right meaning um okay Here's another set. I hope you're finding this interesting. I find it interesting just to look at different translations. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the first verses, verse was it, seven. Uh, and uh, in in Chakuntala, and it's basically the Dushyanta is out, you know, and is on his chariot hunting. And then he sees this deer and the deer jets away and goes into the woods and he chases after her and that's what brings him to the ashrama where he sees Shakuntala. But the image that Kailasa has of this, you know, uh, buck in, in flight, fleeing, is really, I mean, it's like it truly has action in it. Um, so let's look at some of these translations and, and we'll go through them in the same order. Um, I'm going to try to follow, find a try to uh, find a pattern in there about what people were thinking. So here's Jones. Oh, there he runs with his neck bent gracefully, 
looking back from time to time at the car which follows him. Now, through a fear of a descending shaft, he contracts his forehand and extends his flexible haunches. And now, through, the, through fatigue, he pauses to nibble the grass in his path with his mouth half opened. See how he springs and abounds with long steps, lightly skimming the ground and rising high in the air. So it's a very action-packed verse. Um, I do think that, again, Jones misinterpreted the part about the half uh, chewed nibbled grass in his path. Um, what's really happening in that, and it's, it, again, to try to see the kind of, you know, creative, poetic imagination of a poet. Uh, so this, this deer is, 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 is eating and then it, here's the chariot. And so in the middle of eating, it just like bolts off and rushes away. It's turning its neck back, you know, it's, it's, it's legs, it's haunches are, are, are contracted. And then because it's gasping for breath, it has to leave the half chewed grass that it had in its mouth and just, you know, lets it go, spits it out basically and keeps running. So just the, you know, the, the detail of the imagery and the ideas is amazing. All right, let's hear what Monier Williams says. Oh gosh. See, this is, you know, again, a, a, a dating of language. Ah, uh, yay. And anon his graceful neck, he bends to cast a glance at the pursuing car and dreading now the swift descending shaft contracts it into his slender frame about his path. In scatter fragments strewn, the half-chewed grass falls from his panting mouth. That's correct. See, in his airy bounds, he seems to fly and leaves no trace upon the elastic turf. I mean, there's some good parts to this. Um, but again, it, you know, it, it's, it's also a matter of translations are, you know, reflections of the time in which they are made. And so if people were resonating with this kind of language at that time, then okay, that was good for them. But that's why translations, as they say, need to be updated over and over, especially if you're talking about classic works. All right, so here's Ryder. Let's see what he gives us. His neck in beauty bends as backward looks he sends at my pursuing car that threatens death from afar. Fear shrinks to the half, the body small. See how he fears the arrows fall. The path he takes is strewed with blades of grass half chewed from jaws wide with the stress of fevered weariness. He leaps so often and so high, he does not seem to run, but fly. I mean, there's a certain charm to having that sing-songiness of it. Um, so there's, that's our, that's Ryder. Here's Chandra Rajan again, arching his neck with infinite grace now and then, he glances back at the speeding chariot. Thank you. She's the, or they're the first person that you've used chariot. So instead of car, I think speeding car was a little bit kind of a weird translation. His form curving fearful of the arrows fall. The haunches almost touch his chest. Panting from fatigue, his jaws gaping wide. Spill the half-chewed tender grass to mark his path. Um, with long leaps bounding high upwards, See how he soars flying in the sky, scarce skimming the surface of the earth. Okay. There I, I picked up something I hadn't, you know, so that half-chewed grass that he's spitting out then is like leaving a marker for the king to pursue him. So that's also there. See, it's, it's, it's you know, it's very interesting. Repeatedly darts a glance at the pursuing chariot, gracefully twisting his neck with his haunches, drawn acutely forward into his forebody out of fear of the arrow's strike, scattering the path with ha grass half-chewed, dropping it from his mouth, gaping with exhaustion. Look! With his lofty leaps, he moves through the sky and hardly touches the ground. Something seems to have been missing there. Repeatedly he darts, or repeatedly darts, he repeatedly darts a glance at the pursuing chariot. I don't know, that the whole first sentence, I mean, maybe that was part of the translator's goal, and this is another thing you can do, you know, is make a really long sentence to build up that tension and, you know, drama and, uh, and the action of the scene. So maybe that's what he was attempting, Soma Deva. 
Okay, here's Barbara Soler again taking a more sparse approach. The graceful turn of his neck as he glances back at our speeding car, the haunches folded into his chest in fear of my speeding arrow, the open mouth drooping half-chewed grass on our path. Watch how he leaps, bounding on air, barely touching the earth. Again, I, I think the, a lot of the stuff you know doesn't fully um, come out without some kind of context, a little bit more context. All right, here's Michael Coulson, um, and he wrote the uh, Teach Yourself Sanskrit book. Actually, I think he did, this is a pretty good, I, I, I like this one a lot. Gracefully arching his neck to throw a glance at our pursuing chariot, then drawing his hind quarters into his forepart in terror of our arrows, strewing his track with half-chewed grass from a mouth slackened in weariness. In his bounds, he travels the sky and hardly touches the earth. Cal Bate. That was that to me is an excellent translation. Look what he did in that penultimate line: strewing his track with half-chewed grass from a mouth slackened in weariness. You know, it really has it really nice, excellent. So, let me just conclude now with some general thoughts. Um, hopefully, try to tie everything together. Um, Ezra Pound was a really important uh, English poet or American poet who wrote in English. Um, and, you know, again, as I was saying earlier, English gets a lot of criticism sometimes for being, you know, this monolingualizing kind of force and it, or it being like a colonial language and all of this stuff. And all of that is true. No doubt about it. But that doesn't mean that it's not also an incredibly powerful language um, with powerful in the sense that it has certain abilities that languages like Sanskrit don't have. It has the ability to absorb anything into it. English like creates more new words than any other language. It's just like, it's like it has this, you know, energy to it. Um, so pound, um, just as a quick side note in terms of what the idea of literary translation, um, you know, South Asia generally has suffered from, you know, poor translators. Um, even though I did show examples that I think are good, uh, things, things were again, not, not translated as literature itself. It was a translation and there's a difference. Um, and for example, pound, and this is, you, you could argue, total types of cultural appropriation or inappropriate, but pound had a friend who did translations of some uh, Chinese and Japanese poetry, which then pound took without knowing any Japanese or Chinese and created these poems. And they were really, you know, not accurate in the way that we were just looking at poems, but they were evocative in a way that the originals were, at least that's what people uh, say. Or they were, certainly were evocative in English as like good poetry, um, original poetry in a sense. So the you know idea, the, the, the kind of difference between, you know, a, a translation, every translation is a new original. That's basically what, and that was his motto in life was make it new. You know, you have to do it and make it some something new. So here's a quote that, that Pound said about um, English in regard to translation. English literature lives on translation. It is fed by translation. Every new exuberance, every new heave is stimulated by translation. Every allegedly great age is an age of translations. So this idea that the thing that really vitalizes the language is, you know, cultural contact and then the movement of literary ideas from that culture into English by which the target language is enriched. We could talk about this. I'm happy to you know, have other questions. Um, and this is, I just found this today, actually. Um, this is a guy that wrote a, 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 a translation manifesto. Um, so translation, he says, is like an, any art. In the best of cases, it helps shed light on ourselves, on those hidden corners of ourselves that we barely knew existed and whose discovery has enriched us. It exposes us to minds and voices able to awaken in us 
a particular sense of delight, an irrepre irreplaceable thrill of discovery that is available nowhere else. So one is enriching ourselves. And two, really, and there's a whole second, the last line, you know, a particular sense of delight. There's just like a really like, I mean, if you're a translator, you'll know. I mean, there's just like a kind of fun to it um, that, or like is this irreplaceable thrill of discovery. Um, and and it, it, it's, it's beautiful when it happens. And there's a, there's a, you know, there's a Jewish, there's a something that, you know, Maza that comes from that. And I just end with really probably my greatest inspiration as a translator, besides my own teacher, um, who was a student actually of Raman's in, in Chicago. Uh, both my teachers were. And, um, you know, he was, he was a landmark figure because he was the one that really made like translation literary in a South Asian context, I would say. He was a poet himself. He had a way to express things. Um, and I was just reading some of some quotes and I came across this one, which I think is a nice way to end. Um, Dancers and composers have translated my translations further into their own arts. And I just the other day did something with Megadutham and dance and, you know, the, the, these things live on. Um, over the years, the poems have appeared not only in a variety of anthologies, but in wedding services. The ancient poets composed in Tamil for their Tamil corner of the world of antiquity. But as nothing human is alien, and that's a beautiful phrase, nothing human is alien. They have reached ages unborn and accents yet unknown. I am grateful and astonished to be one of the links undreamed of by them or by me. So this idea that, you know, you, you create something and that creation then becomes the basis for another creation. So your translation is then is the original and that original is then further translated. And you're in this kind of genealogy of, you know, a text. Um, again, he also mentioned ages unborn, you know? So th this, idea, this idea of like a whole period or a whole age of translation, um, even it, it, like I, when I was er speaking earlier about Telugu and Kannada and all these, you know, languages that, you know, their early periods are called like Anuada Yugam, the age of translation. That's what like revitalized or not revitalized, but vitalized those into a literary power. And, you know, right now there's tons of translation happening into English. Um, we should have translation happening into Indian languages. But again, this is something that we saw. This just wasn't happening that much. It was like whoever read the Indian languages, read the Indian languages. And that was it. You know, that building of, of readership or anything was you know, particularly not there. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but it's just something to think about. Um, but again, I understand people want to learn English. You know, school is in English. This is, you know, like English has a different kind of prestige power now in terms of, you know, employment and all of these things. So it's complicated. Anyway, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, very much. Um, these are uh, my books, three of which are translations. And um, yeah, I'll stop sharing and we can have discussion. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful and insightful lecture. So now we begin with the Q&A session for which I would like to ask Ms. Aditi to moderate. Over to you, Aditi. Thank you, Rajvi. Hello, sir. Well, beautiful presentation, and thank you so much for the lecture. Yeah. Yeah. So the floor is open for questions. You can either put the, your questions on chat box or you can raise your hand. Yes, Koshi. Sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, Sinivas, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, as you were uh, giving us, you know, a, a sample of various translations, one one particular, you know, feature which struck me 
was how, uh, for example, Arthur Ryder in his translation refers to the pursuing car as my, you know, pursuing car, my, you know, was referring to himself, uh, who is uh, saying that. Whereas Barbara Miller and uh, Michael Colson uses the plural, our, our speeding car, uh, I think Michael Colson said our speeding chariot. So I just want to know what was the original in, in, in I mean, how this freedom, my, the possessive, my and ours, the collective uh, is possible. Uh, and what was the original Sanskrit uh, rendition by Kalidasa about the chariot, pursuing chariot? We'll have to look, but, you know, probably some people say either he's saying we like he's talking to he and the charioteer. Mm -hmm. So we we the two of them together, or probably, and I think this is probably he was using the honorific we for himself. I think. Okay. Yeah. But sure. that's a good, that's a good question. Um, we should check. Yeah, I, I was just curious on that one. Perhaps it's an honorific addressing also, or it could be even a dialogue between the. Charioteer and the king. That, that, that's what they usually say here. I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that, that was a good question. Anyone else? Uh, okay. Yes, Lakshmiji, you can unmute. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I, I just want to bring to your notice one interesting thing. Uh, during my MPhil, I came across one Dalit intellectual of Andhra. He's uh, Guram Joshua. He was a... Uh, oh, I love Guram Joshua. <laughs> yes. I, then you must be knowing his work, Gabilam, the bat. Totally. So it's, it's my dream to translate Gabilam because, it, you know, it's you know I did Megadutam and then I wanted to do Gabilam. But my friend uh, is working on a translation. He, he, said, he says he's going to be done soon, but yeah. Yeah, so in that work, uh, the other, like, uh, uh, like the hero of that, uh, Gabilam, uh, he is un untouchable. So he compares oh. himself with the uh, hero of the Megadutam. And oh. he says, uh, for uh, uh, since the hero of Megadutam is rich and affluent, uh, he has clouds and, uh, you know, swans and anything can be his messengers. But who will be my messenger? I am just poor and untouchable person. Everybody, like, you know, they deny my existence. So who will be my, uh, like, you know, messenger? Then he requests Bat to be his messenger to God. Yep. So to, like, you know, solve his problems, to look after him. Yep. Uh, yep. So this is how, like, this is not translation of Megadutam or Kaldas's work, but this is how Megadutam was carried down to the, you know, other uh, traditions and other, like, you know, forms. So I just thought, like, I should bring this to your notice. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, Gabilam, I, you know, yeah, I, I love that. I love Gurum Joshua. He was, you know, truly one of the last great, I would say, classical poets. Um, yes, Gabilam was written in a poetic form, in Telugu, but yeah, it yeah. is in poetic form, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, full chandas, full everything. And yes, he takes that theme. Um, and just on, on that point, you know, uh, you know, Megadutta, this idea of a cloud sending a message between these you know parted lovers uh that theme that the that became a whole genre of literature duta kavya messenger poems of any yeah. kind it could be a mega duta it could be a hamsa duta it could be any you know anything so the the the, the interesting thing is not only did he write this poem he wrote he like created a new genre which then went into all different languages with different things. And then, like in this case, went even one step further and like, you know, inspired, you know, kind of a whole other story. Thank you. But yeah, it's a very good example. It's the same uh, Joshua, Smashana uh, Vartiya, same poet, poet, no? Guram Joshua's Telugu poet. Yes. Yeah. Ashana Matika is M. Lashmi. It's the same one you are referring to? Yes, I, th I think he's the same one. He has written several books. And uh, in most of his books, he also uh, spoken about like freedom movement and uh, the, you know, uh, participation of Dalits in that and their uh, role yeah. and everything. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even, even, even so in Kapil Sharma. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You know, once I had a chance of listening to a, I mean, one of my friends, you know, reciting this particular poetry. I mean, Smashana Vatiya, Telugu. Okay. okay. His poems are really gems, sir. And uh, like, I should have some more. Like, if uh, if any occasion comes, I'll de definitely like you know. Yeah. 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 Firdosi Kavya, I read some when I was in yes. school. Yes. Yes. That that also is Anil, you had a question? Yes, sir. Namaskar. Namaskar. Uh, sir, I'm a PhD student from JNU. And right now I'm in Portugal, in University of Porto, doing my PhD. Uh, sir, uh, my question is like, uh, while we translate Sakuntala into whatever language, like I'm trying to do in Portuguese. Sir, the letters are Hota, Yasman, Purohit, Nad. Sir, Nad ko agar Nad jo hai usse voice karein. The voice is not Nad. Nad is something else. Yeah. Purohit ya Yasman. So, sir, in such clist sabd hain. While we translate, how can we deal with such kind of things, sir? So, it's difficult. That's the whole challenge of the translation. And you have to make decisions. You have to ask yourself, what is my main decision? Is my main decision uh that you know i want to be absolutely accurate to what that word is no that's actually a bad decision to make because like you're saying not doesn't mean this exactly or here's the other problem not means 100 things in different sentences you know what i mean so yes, yes yeah so you have to look at the context of that thing where it is and and, and then really you have to see what is the meaning that is going to come across to a reader who doesn't know what this is? So much good. Like, okay, sir. it means what? Really, in translation, you have to put your emphasis on the target language. But you have to understand everything perfect about the original language. But focused must be on the target language. Right, sir. I understood. Uh, while you're translating another poet, like from is writer from Portugal, it's a Julio Luis Paisoto. I have done the translation. The peso cultural culture load of that, sir. That word, sir. It's very difficult while we translate to put that same cultural load into that target language, and sir, that is I'm finding very somewhere lost in translation. You know, while it's, we do such kind it, of things. This is difficult. This is this this is exactly the difficult. I mean, it, you know, it's like they say like translation basically is impossible right but but yet we do it and like that guy wrote there's some maza in it otherwise you wouldn't be sitting around doing right there's because here, here's the thing yad two months you'll break your head on on one phrase that like you said it doesn't have the that cultural weight to it that i want and then you know achanak it'll come to you like ah that's the word that will make it you know make sense and do what i want it to do and you know, so you have to wait for that. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay, so by the time we have another question, I would like to ask something. Uh, in uh, government of India right now has this project called Ashtadhyayi, uh, where you are given fellowships or scholarships to translate some other languages, uh, materials or poetry from other languages to Sanskrit. Uh, what is your take on all of this? Because uh, do you think it is something worth investing into? Would people be interested in, because Sanskrit is such a niche language now, hardly. I mean, exactly. I mean, to be honest, I, I don't understand. What, I mean, who are you doing that? You have to understand, who is that person? This is what I'm saying. That target language of Sanskrit, though. Are there native Sanskrit speakers that are just dying to read, you know, like a Turkish novel or something? I mean, no way. You know, I mean, if you want to read a Turkish novel, then either you learn Turkish or you read the English translation. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, see, this is what the, you know, the government, it's so sad. I mean, there's so much important work to be done and they're always going in funny ways. Like you're going to put crores of money into people translating book, literature from another place into Sanskrit so that nobody will read anything. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense, Yad. 
you need we we have so many works in sanskrit that have not been translated into other indian languages no one's working on that yeah but if you can get a scholarship and and work on your language skills then by by all means madam you should do it <laughs> Yeah, so exactly. That's where it all leads to. It's, uh, Ashtadhyayi, you know, you know what the Ashtadhyayi is? I'm sure you do. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's like it's uh, like attempting to translate something from English to Latin now, no? In the present times. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. It's like let's create a, a board to translate all of Malgudi tales into Latin. I mean, who who cares, yeah? I mean, yeah, karto karo. You know, it's like if you want, like, but. <laughs> <laughs> there's just so many more important things to be doing. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Uh, we shall put uh, uh, Professor's uh, email ID in the chat box. So if you have any further queries or discussions, you can be in, get in touch with him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sympathy for the trader. Sorry. There's a there's something. That... Yes, traditory, traditory. The, the translator is a traitor, yes. Um, it could be referred to the power dynamic of a translator being in control of a text and how it is known, read, understood, and how it is carried further. And just to entertain the idea of who or what is being, it is the text is, is this okay? Well, I think, I think in this context, generally when they quote this uh, Italian saying, it's it's the idea that, that I was kind of saying before to Anil, like translation is impossible. So like no matter what you do, you're going to betray the original. You're going to betray something. You will not be faithful, basically. Because it's an impossible task, every translation is unfaithful. So you're, you know, you're not a faithful, uh, you know, to the original. I think that's the idea. Um, but yeah, that, 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 that is what I think probably um he was referring to i mean like i said you know there, there, maybe we can end on this you know this uh famous saying that you always get is lost in translation right oh it's lost in translation it, it, something's always lost something's always lost in translation um but salman rushdie always used to say that's true that's true that's true but something's always gained in translation too so just see the positive side uh, of the whole thing. Like even what I tried to say about Orientalism, you must critique those colonial scholars and the kind of attitudes that they had and you know what, how they were involved with the colonial machinery. But they were also genuinely you know, good scholars who did a lot of important work that uh, we still rely on today. Um, so anyway, uh, th there's a lot to be gained in, in the act of translating. I think uh, you, as a skill too, you know, it, it, it sharpens the mind. I mean, the other thing, I didn't really get into this as much as I wanted to, but, you know, for an Indian, it's totally different. That This is what I mean about teaching an Indian, teaching, you know, in America, people only speak one language, English, that they don't even, like being bilingual is like a big deal. I mean, it's not common at all. I never met an Indian, no matter what class of society they're from, that doesn't speak at least three languages. And probably could understand a couple more. No, nowhere I ever went. So the idea, again, of what translation means to an Indian is, is, is different. Uh, it's not, I think, as literal as the Western concept would be. Anyway. So much to talk about, but that's it. Any last question? Okay. I probably bored you guys like enough now. <laughs> Not at all, sir. Okay. Thank you uh, for participating, everyone. And uh, over to you, Rajvi. Thank you, Aditi, for coordinating this session. Well, we are nearly at the end of the lecture session. So here I request Sagar to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Srinivas Reddy, sir, for delivering an excellent lecture and making this gathering a very meaningful and interesting. I would like to express our deep gratitude to Dr. Koshi, sir, for his presence in the event. I'm happy to express a vote of thanks to all our faculty members, sister scholars, 
for the valuable inputs for organizing the event. Lastly, a big thanks to all the students, participants for showing their enthusiasm for the event. Thank you all. Over to Rajiv. Thank you very much, Sagar. And thank you all, and we'll be back next month with another online guest lecture. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Sinivas, for your wonderful presentation. It was really, you know. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Stimulating. And, and let me also share with you, perhaps, uh, I think this talk might be the first uh, in, in uh, the School of Sanskrit Philosophy and Studies about literature and Sanskrit. I mean, okay. now the talks were mostly on philosophy. So I think this is a truly literature Sanskrit translation. So you you, you were the inaugural you know speaker for the school. So thank thanks you. for accepting the invitation, and we hope in future too we would have many more occasions to listen to you. Yeah, hopefully, thanks once again, and hopefully in person next time. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Okay, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.